Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. My name is Greg Tito, and this is the segment where I jump into talking about little bits of D&D lore with these amazing lore masters usually, but today we only have one. That's right. Mr. Chris Perkins. I will try to carry the load. You shall carry Matt Cernan's load. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> <laughs> wow hopefully he's watching he's watching at home so uh it doesn't Ooh, come off weird but like hey matt we have to tell you about what i said mm. uh. <laughs> welcome to lore you should know my name is greg tito and i am joined by only one lore master today yep mr chris yep. Perkins. yep happy to be here matt certain it will not be here on this particular one that's why we picked particularly he's had enough of us Yes, he was like, I'm out, yeah. uh, but also uh, wanted to make sure we had stuff that you could talk about. Uh, so we talk about anything. You could talk about anything. Yep. And I'm going to throw Morden Kanan at you. Okay. He is a wizard from the world of Greyhawk. Uh, oh, yes. One of the eight. In fact, the found he created the Circle of Eight. Is that he, right? Yes, he did. He also created the Citadel of Eight. Oh. So what's the difference, you ask? Well, yes. First of all, for those who don't know, Morden Kanan was Gary Gygax's wizard character. Um, did he, he played with it, or did he only use it as a dungeon master? So early on, early in the 70s, before the, before the game that we know released, mm. he ran a DD and d campaign set in his world of Greyhawk for his friends. And he decided that he was going to take a break and give the DMing duties over to somebody else for a short time. And so he took his... He took a hand at playing a character, and the character created for himself was a first-level wizard named Morden Kanan. Oh. And that character pretty much carried him through his entire time at TSR until the time when he left. And uh, he left not only TSR but Morden Kanan behind and moved on to other things. But Morden Kanan has survived the ages. Uh, and I didn't know that. Over the course of history, both real and imagined, has grown in power. From the, the lowly beginnings at first from his, level. From his lowly first level days, and anybody who's played first edition, like early edition D&D, knows how frail first edition characters are. So yeah. it's, it's really a matter of luck that he has survived until now, but maybe not all luck, because Gary Gygax, Gary Gygax can pretty much do what he wants. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Morden Kanan was his character, and uh, he formed, or he became part of, an adventuring party. Uh, the leader of the adventuring party nominally that was called the Citadel of Eight. And they went around doing all kinds of mischief, getting into all kinds of trouble and getting treasure and magic items and all that kind of thing. And those, uh, that party uh, grew to include a wizard who became Morden Kanan's apprentice mm -hmm. named Bigby. Now, was that also a character, like a player? Uh, uh, a player character, yeah. Okay. Uh, Tensor. Another notable wizard joined that party. And then they also had some uh, fighter types in um, Robolar and Irag, or Irag, and a couple clerics, which is always wise in first edition, named Certain and Rigby. Rigby. Not to be confused with Bigby. And played, then played by the <laughs> same person, <laughs> probably. Right. And then there was the <laughs> Ranger Otis, the, uh, the seldom spoken of Ranger Otis. Uh, and they were the Citadel of Eight. Oh, I didn't. oh, so they were the, the the group was called the Citadel of Eight. That's right, because there were eight of them. And so, what was the circle? And they were of tough. Eight? So, after that campaign, I guess ended. Uh, a number of products were created in the D and D line that included Morden Kanan in them in one way, shape, or form. Probably the most notable one was an adventure from first edition called Morden Kanan's Fantastic Adventure. Mm -hmm. Uh, which statted up Morden Kanan in the back of the book, and you could run him as a character through the adventure with some other people that you may or may not be aware of. Right. Um, those were not his official stats, by the way. Gary Gygax never shared the official stats for Morden I was Kanan. Just, I was going to ask that. So that's other not people, like his character correct. she translated? No. They just made up no, stats? No, people had to make up stuff because he mm. didn't share his character with anyone. Why was that? Do you know? Because mm, I guess he felt it, like it was a kind of a private thing. No, oh, I guess that's true. Um, yeah, we get so so public yes. with our character sheets, but you're right, there is a... So if you've seen Morden Kanan stats in print, chances are they are not, in fact, the real Morden Kanan stats. Interesting. Yes. I like but, that level of mystery. Right, exactly. Um, and so you could play him in some way, shape, or form. And it was in later products that this idea of the Circle of Eight came around, and it's not clear whether Gary had any hand in its creation. 
but uh, later things, I think it was like the From the Ashes box set or one of the later box sets for Greyhawk, basically positioned Morden Kanan as this super powerful mage who basically starts the Circle of Eight as a group of wizards, wizards only, Yeah. Um, to basically kind of be this star chamber, secret council, kind of working behind the scenes to control empires and keep the power where the power should be and to take it away from people who can't handle it and things like that. And that included some old members of the Citadel, like Tensor and uh, Bigby, and then some new wizards. So uh, they didn't include, but they they didn't include the the, the fighter types and the, and the Otis mm, no. in those lists. No. Okay. No. So they and, were all wizards. And some of them, some of the original uh, founding members of the group, uh, the Citadel, had died off by then. Like certain uh, creator of certain spell immunity, the spell, uh, oh. he he perished in a battle called the Battle of Emerald Meadows, um, which was a great battle that the Citadel fought in and. Um, now, was that the, a ba- like a, a game session of Kai X and his crew, or was that immortalized it, later it, in a, in a so novel? So, I, I, I believe it was actually part of the campaign and then was sort of name dropped in Temple of Elemental Evil. Ah, okay. The, the adventure that Gary wrote with uh, Rob Kuntz. Um, and uh, in that adventure, the mention of the, the rise of the temple uh, leading to adventurers and the forces of good converging on the temple to destroy it. That battle played out in a place called Emerity Meadows. Oh, I see. Okay, that was the way to. Yep. Yes. Got it. Uh, the only time that Emerity Meadows has been really been explored in a in a project was in issue two twenty one of Dungeon Magazine, uh, where there was an adventure called the Battle of Emerity Meadows, where you could actually play it out. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and so but once it morphed into being more of the circle of eight. By then, Morden Kanan was part of the D&D IP and all kinds of people were using it. Uh, all kinds of designers were inserting him into adventures and things. And in fact, uh, he showed up in some very unusual places. Dragon Magazine had a series, a long running series written by Ed Greenwood, grandfather of the Forgotten Realms. The series was called The Wizards Three, where Elminster, Morden Kanan, and Dalimar from the Dragonlance setting would all meet in Ed Greenwood's kitchen in Canada and trade stories and uh, banter back and forth um, as wizards are wont to do. I love that as like a uh, meta thing mm-hmm. that encompasses both our real world and something right. you almost touched in in the most recent yeah. uh, Acquisition Incorporated uh, yes. uh, uh, show in which yes. you're like, oh, they're here in, in... And we consider that, we consider those articles as weird and bizarre as they are to be kind of semi-canonical elements of the world, of the multiverse. This concept that you can get from the Forgotten Realms to Greyhawk to Canada, yeah, and that they can all coexist in the same material plane. So it's only Canada and the Pacific Northwest <laughs> that, that people can go to, right? That's <laughs> 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 Did you work on those? Were you an editor on those? Uh, uh, no, I was a, I was, I was just a young upstart freelancer when the Wizards Three articles were g- given birth. But having survived as long as I have, and I continue to work with Ed Greenwood, we have done things since. Like for instance, if you've read um, Ed Greenwood's uh, last novel, Death Masks. It takes place in Waterdeep, but uh, Morden Kanan appears in it. Oh. So that was me asking Ed if he would, you know, hearken back to the good old days, to those articles, and rekindle that sort of friendship. That's cool. Yeah. Just so, so people know that it still existed. Um, and then you also, uh, you know, did some of that with uh, some other recent adventures uh, with uh, uh, Curse of for example. Yes. That's where, that's the, sort of the most recent place in our RPGs where Morden Kanan has been, spoiler, where Morden Kanan has made an appearance. Hinted at. Anyway. Yes. Well, right. no, he's he's there. Okay. Uh, and he's named and you can actually meet him and he can walk around with you. In fact, when I was um, running Curse of Strahd in my live stream game, Dice Camera Action, Morden Kanan appears and helps the Waffle Crew out of a tight spot. And um, Sam Whitwer, who is a big D&D aficionado and fan, brilliant actor too got him to play the role which is great he's a good actor which is great because (laughs) um uh he knows the the history of D&D so well yeah that he can kind of authenticate some things and he gave it like gary's voice and um oh no uh, way yeah i didn't realize that that he was he was mimicking gary's voice yeah he was he was homage an homage to gary's voice that is super cool yeah so uh 
you know, people might have read, if you know none of that history, you might have at least seen some of the spells that bear Morden yes. Kanan's name yes. in, in D&D lore for, for a long time, right? Yeah, and several of them have survived into the present edition. Uh, Morden Kanan's magnificent mansion is probably the favorite, uh, which allows you to create an extra dimensional mansion that you can hide out in that your enemies can't get at you right. inside of. It's not just a, yeah. a, a hole, a portable hole. It's no, an actual no. mansion. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's got all the all the decor and everything else. So you feel very important all of a sudden. Now, what I mean, we we kind of glossed over this, but like, what what kind of a person was Morden Kanan? What what was his personality? Um, I don't know his personality as portrayed by the Grand Master of D and D himself, Gary Gygax, but in print, uh, he has been described as a dick. A bit of an ass. <laughs> um, and that's because the nature of Greyhawk and the types of heroes that typically come out of Greyhawk tend to be more kind of self-serving and self-interested and self-directed than a lot of other campaign settings. In Greyhawk, your, your job really is as an adventure to go out, kill monsters, and take their stuff. And taking stuff and becoming more powerful are kind of like the hallmarks of that setting. And uh, I believe his alignment is chaotic neutral. Oh, that's which means that um, he is can be unpredictable and that his ethics don't fall in sort of the good or evil spectrum. Um, and so uh, in in lately, we've sort of interpreted that as being that it's hard to sort of pierce whether or not he has a code or what ultimately drives what he does. And his drives may change from moment to moment. Um, but we speculate that one of the things that does interest him is the nature of how the cosmos works. And so he is fascinated with tinkering with that and inserting himself into cosmic events to see what happens. Mm. So in that way, he can be an agent of chaos. Um, he might send adventurers on a mission, for instance, without knowing exactly what the repercussions of that mission are, just to see what, how, what the response is. Um, and that's, you know, part of being brilliant uh, and part of having a lot of time, uh, an immortal life, basically. Um, he's like all powerful wizards. He sustains himself through magic, longevity, potions and the like. He's never gone the path of the lich. So that's, that's good. So that's so he's not all bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's at least neutral. I mean, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I think by and large, he's probably done more harm to or more good to the multiverse than harm. Um, maybe accidentally. So but uh, that's and interesting. Yeah. All right. So, but but he is also just in his demeanor. He's right. kind of yeah. Uh, but uh, if he comes into town, he's not going to be suppressed by any of the laws of the town or anything like that. He's going to do what he his heart desires. And if somebody gets hurt, uh, he might feel bad about it for a while. But he's going to move on. Does he have any uh, like strong relationships? Does he have any people that he has known for a long time beyond the the circle of eight? Um, unclear. Uh, as far as I know, he's never had a family. Um, he's had apprentices, but only scarce few. Mm -hmm. I think there's one uh, mentioned in the early Wizards 3 articles named Ralph Thaney or Ralph Thien, um, Big B. Uh, yeah, so Big B was his apprentice. How did that work? So originally, uh, Big B was a character created by Rob Kuntz, one of um, Gary's gaming buddies. Oh, okay. And because Rob often took over Gary's DMing duties, the characters didn't always interact, but they kind of lived in the same universe. But apparently there was a session where they were both able to get together and they had a bit of a throwdown until um, Morden Kanan defeated Big B, mm. forced him into service, and then eventually, I guess, a friendship emerged out of that somehow. Oh, okay. So they were, they were adversaries. They were adversarial, kind of and then that turned into a... a Morden Kane proved himself to be the more powerful wizard, and so Bigby kind of fell in line. I see. Yeah. That's interesting. And you might know Bigby from uh, uh, Bigby's Hand. Bigby's Hand, which in earlier editions was a multitude of spells. Mm -hmm. um, they were all separate spells, which we combined into one and fifth. Which makes sense. Yep. Easy. So Morden Kane is still alive. He's still kicking, still traveling the multiverse. Would you say he's a, uh, what, you know, if people wanted to stat him up now, is he a 20th level wizard? Is he a 30th uh, yeah. level? He, like what, what? He is, he is minimum 20th level. Yeah. Um, we don't really have epic level type things uh, after that, but. Uh, would, not, not in this edition yeah. yet. Um, but he would be beyond yes. the, the normal scope. Yes. Uh, he would be, he would be uh, more than a, a challenge for uh, our ancient red dragon 
um, or a bail or a demon. Interesting. Yeah. Now, does he also create uh, spells still? Is that part of his love? Presumably. Is, is, is yep. always experimenting Presumably. and creating new yep. things? There are other Morden Canaan's blank spells out there. Um, That's a fun way yep. to bring it into your campaign if you wanted to, yes. to, to create a spell and be possibly, like, oh, it's Morden Canaan's blank. Possibly the most um, uh, horrendous spell in the game is his. Uh, it's a g- it's a spell that we haven't brought back to fifth edition, as far as I know yet, called Morden Canaan's Disjunction. Oh, I remember this. It's a very very nasty spell. You cast it, and basically all magic items within a field are destroyed. Um, that yeah. seems like such a dungeon master thing y- to do, Gary yes. Gygax. So anybody who's ever who's, <laughs> who's aware of his gaming style knows that it's the it's the pr- it's the penultimate or ultimate Gary Gygax spell. Um, yeah, you can't kill their characters. Just, fine, take away their magic screw, items. It's a real screw to players. Oh. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. Yeah. So they, won't, they won't be resurrected, those magic right. items. So we have been hesitant to bring that bastard spell back into the game. <laughs> but, no. but it typifies, it, it's like emblematic of Morden Kanan as a personality. Yeah, that's true. I like my magic items. I don't like yours. Yeah. yeah. I'd much rather be on, on the yeah. one holding all the cards. Yes, exactly. That makes sense. Uh, so uh, what are some other ideas that people might use to, uh, uh, if, if you like this idea of, of there being this uber powerful spellcaster like Morning Canyon can go from different worlds, yeah. how, would, how would other people want to bring them to, to their campaigns or their home settings? Um, I think that he is best as an instigator, as somebody who can kind of get the characters on a course. He often appears in disguise when he's traveling abroad, so oh. as not to attract attention to himself. And does so he have like one disguise? or does His like common community? disguise is that of a basically like a... A, a poor merchant, mm. uh, basically a, ba- a badly dressed kind of scuzzy man that you wouldn't, if you were to look at, you wouldn't stand out in a crowd. Uh, he wouldn't strike you as being a particularly interesting personality. Um, so uh, he moves incognito in, in ways. Whereas in real life, he's actually quite flamboyant. If you've seen any art of him in the past, he's, he's quite, um, there's a bearing to him uh, that's quite regal he dresses flamboyantly his mm. robes and such are quite over the top and always neat right like it yes. best fastidious yes, yes. Um, his look has changed over editions too he went from having this sort of uh, tangled black hair and a van dyke beard shot with gray to basically losing his hair going bald and having a sort of more ming the merciless presence mm. yeah. and that was more why did his uh, visit like did he grow up and he's like I think I want to look more like Chris uh, Perkins I think I think that they're just kind of two s- there was a there was a sense that some, somewhere along the line somebody just wanted to update his look mm. and so he got a bit of a refresher and I think the first time his his uh, bald pate was figured prominently was on the cover of a um, third edition book called uh, Expedition to the Ruins of Greyhawk mm. and since then we've seen that look kind of become more prominent and the 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 older younger Morden Kanan's look has not appeared quite so often I like uh, I don't know why but my story headcanon is that uh, uh, he had a moment where he like he shaved everything off and he, that's like, possible and he, like, he is like chaotic neutral trans- yeah, yeah, right? never know yeah yeah all right it's like that's yeah. that royal Tannenbaum scene so I should point out um, since it just occurred to me that we do stat up Morden Kanan in Curse of Strahd uh, but he's done in a way that is meant to not take up a ton of space mm. and he's i think he's basically like the equivalent of a of a lich in power i see um so he has been statted up in a form but were i to actually create a character sheet for him i'd probably go the whole nine yards and it was mostly done just to make sure that it, hey if you get into a fight here's right, what you need exactly to, we, to we gave we gave a certain amount of information so the dm could run a character um who was super powerful and all that but right uh Really, really, to do Morden Kane injustice, you have to, you have to build him up as a player character. Interesting, as yeah. he was always meant to be. I love that that he went from you know the the person who created this game's player character mm-hmm. into uh, being a part of a big part of the lore. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, cool. Anything else uh, about Morden Kane or his or his friends or apprentices uh, before we um, sign off here? His name has been pronounced Morden Kane and Morden Kynan. Uh, as far as I know, both are correct. All right. Which one does he prefer? <laughs> I would love to ask Gary to find out. Oh, yeah. I think generally most people. I th- I'd say maybe eighty percent of the audience calls him Morden Kanan. Um, but if you do say Morden Kanan, okay. Yeah, he's he's chaotic. He understands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Awesome. Cool. Uh, where can people find uh, you to uh, ask you questions about uh, all of this? I am on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. 
Awesome. Uh, you can follow me at Greg Tito, and that'll be it for this edition of Lore You Should Know. Uh, check back next week for some more uh, lore and or sage advice. Thanks, you guys.